A warning to our listeners. This episode contains strong language. Previously, on Looking for the Tote Family. I didn't stop this because I wasn't there. I don't remember anything pretty much over Christmas and the first week I got here. I went over because Zoe wanted her Mickey silver necklace. That was the one last thing we needed. I was supposed to wake up at 11, 11.30 and didn't wake up till the next morning. And so I'm realizing it and I'm really, you know, I'm like, holy shit, you know, the amount of control she had. I'm sorry, I was forced to move away from you guys. So, um, that was all her. She didn't want anybody knowing anything about what was going on. And for people who don't know what's going on or anything, they would definitely not know anything Megan was doing. Multiple attempts in the last, there's been over a time frame. From the day in New London, Connecticut, I'm Sten Spinella. And I'm Taylor Hartz. And this is Looking for the Tote Family. They'll come by and just be like, when you get out of here, you gotta write a book. When you get home, you gotta write a book. We want me in the books written. In a letter from jail dated June 19th, 2020, Tony wrote to his father, Robert Tote, and challenged everything we've learned about this case thus far. He takes Robert through the date his three children and wife were killed in excruciating detail. He brings us closer to the actual crime scene than we've ever been. The sprawling 27-page letter takes frequent detours that are sometimes nonsensical. But these asides do give us a better picture of what the Totes family life was like and what Tony's mindset is like now. The happy home people thought the Totes had apparently didn't include a perfect marriage. Rather than insinuating his wife Megan was the killer, as he did in phone calls with his sister Chrissy, in this letter Tony outright blames Megan for her death and the murders of Alec, Tyler, Zoe, and Breezy. Still, Tony's story doesn't exactly match what he told his sister, or with what investigators say he told them. The FBI said he copped a healthcare fraud, and the Osceola County Sheriff's Office said he confessed to the murders of his family. In the letter to his father, though, Tony claims he didn't commit the murders or the healthcare fraud he's accused of. Megan did. You'll hear one of our producers, Carlos Virgen, reading Tony's letter. Carlos is reading the letter verbatim, so you may hear some things that are factually or grammatically incorrect. Robert, please excuse the impersonal nature of printing in this letter. But seeing as it is too painful to write legible script, it will have to do. I will explain later. I have recently been released off suicide watch, as I was placed due to the circumstances, horrific as they were, in December 2019, that the media and sheriff's department here are making me out to be the next butcher of Baghdad. Thanks to counseling here, the chaplain services, and my sister, I am beginning to resemble the proud man I was prior to the incident, which shattered me beyond comprehensible ways. I remain in isolated, protected custody to protect me, as I am not jail material, and to protect my case. I write to you in response to the letters I received from you, to correct all inaccuracies created and generated by the creative writing machine, press, to sell papers and the sheriff's department who want to score a big win after screwing up a prior murder case that the governor of Florida had to intervene and move it out of the district. To respond to your absurd allegation in your last letter and to offer you forgiveness. First of all, I am 10,000% innocent of all these preposterous charges, both on this state case and on the proposed Medicaid fraud case. The statements taken from me were interesting to say the least. In 27 pages of nearly illegible script, Tony's claims of innocence, 10,000% innocence, are the only words he underlines. He wrote the words in all capital letters and underlined them twice to stress their importance. And in the next sentence, he put the words Medicaid fraud in quotes, as if referring to a made-up claim, not an entire investigation against him. Tony has a much different tone in the letter to his father than in his phone calls with Chrissy. He seems defiant. And while he was vague when talking to his sister on the phone about what actually happened the day his family was killed and his role in it, in speaking to his father, he's direct. He is not just innocent, 
but 10,000% innocent. It's the first time we've heard him say clearly that he's innocent of both the murders and the accused healthcare fraud. I'm writing to you in confidence. Please do not share with anyone but your wife, as I need not to be shown off as a trophy again, nor do I need to contend with the results of the telephone game when it is time to testify in a couple of months. Please do not break my confidence. Tony asks his dad not to share this letter with anyone except his wife, to keep it between them. But it was sent out to journalists by the state's attorney's office and published dozens of times. It was even featured in People magazine. So these words that he hoped to keep private have probably been read by millions of people. In the phone calls we've heard, Tony and his sister remind each other to be careful about what they say, not to hash out details of the case while they're on a recorded line. Tony seems to understand that anything he says over the phone or in letters that he mails from the jail isn't really private. Yet he spills pages and pages of details to his father anyway. I am ashamed to say yes. I did attempt suicide multiple times. As to my recollection, I want to say eight times. I am told this is natural given the circumstances of having the rug pulled out from underneath me and my world shattered. My wife and my children were, and still are, everything to me. I love my wife still very deeply, and it will be the hardest thing to sit there and tell everyone that it was her that did this when I was not home. And then she committed suicide in front of me. This is the first time we hear Tony explicitly say that Megan killed their kids. He's hinted at the blame before, but here he makes it clear. This is also the first time we hear him say that Megan committed suicide. Based on what we'd heard in the phone calls, we'd assumed by this point that Tony was going to blame Megan for the murders of their children. But we hadn't quite worked out what story he was going to tell about Megan's death. Megan was stabbed to death, but we know her death wasn't a suicide. When a medical examiner conducts an autopsy, they not only rule on the cause of death, whether the person was drowned or shot or stabbed, they also rule on the manner in which they died. Megan's death was ruled a homicide. She died by homicidal violence at the hands of someone else. I have forgiven her as I know she was chronically sick since 2011, 2012, when a bug bit her in Disney, of all places. That, with time and everything else, led to our first miscarriage of Avery Nicole. Borderline liver failure, drug-induced hepatitis, LFTs were 3,800 to 3,825, normal is 25. Vagus nerve dysfunction, depression, in addition to that suffered from her father's suicide, one of my close friends in 2002-2003. Tony said Megan had family trauma of her own, including her father Albert Gula's suicide in 2002 and her estrangement from her mother. Tony alleges later in the letter that her family life was a factor in her depression. A 2002 Day story quotes Megan's father at length talking about water quality in Montville. He was the president of the Kittimog Orchards Association, a group that manages the water system for a housing development of more than 100 houses in town. I reached out to the group, and they still had members who knew Al Gula personally. I was told that he was a fantastic association president and an excellent carpenter. His obituary describes him as an independent contractor. I was also told that Al's suicide shocked people in town, and they didn't understand why he did it. He hung himself from a tree outside a pump station in Montville, where water is drawn from wells in the area. This was likely a station he would drive to every morning to check on the association's wells. We had heard that Megan was sick, but we'd also heard that she was a homeschool teacher, an active yogi, a devoted mom who was always cooking and baking. But Tony goes on to describe the opposite, a woman who was almost helpless. He lists not only one chronic illness, Lyme disease, but a laundry list of medical conditions. Tachycardia would wake up with heart rate over 180. Breathing difficulties at rest, Lyme's disease, chronic pain, joint laxity, weight loss from 125 pounds muscularly ripped from being an internationally trained yoga teacher to barely holding on to 90 pounds with loss of all female features, in addition to a multitude of other physical and functional deficits. 
When describing Megan's illnesses, Tony also says something about her loss of female features, which presumably means that she'd lost so much weight that the size of her breasts and maybe other parts of her body had decreased or lost their shape. Including this fact in the letter seems insensitive and irrelevant, considering the severe health conditions he's describing, and even inappropriate for a husband who is supposedly grief-stricken over her loss. We moved to Florida in our condo originally because the sun and warmth made her feel better, and eventually permanently for that reason, and there were more homeschooling and performing arts opportunities for the boys. Megan's illness was one reason for the family's move to Florida. According to Tony, this long-term illness caused Megan debilitating pain that prevented her from a lot of daily activities, from going to the grocery store to driving the kids around. We sold the house in Colchester in 2017 after just finishing a greater than $50,000 remodel. That included all new furniture for living room, dining room, kitchen, new kitchen cabinets, new counter, painting all the downstairs, new lighting, finishing the basement, ripping up the grout while maintaining the kitchen tile, replacing grout, completing a 1,600 to 1,800 square foot two-level deck with a hot tub, and replacing the carpet upstairs with engineered hardwood. I essentially did the work myself with intermittent help from friends and help from my boys when they would fly back with me. Not even a year after remodel, she decided we would move to Florida full-time and sell the house. Whatever she wanted, I did. I took my vows of love, honor, and obey, protect as religion and sacred. In the phone calls and in this letter, Tony repeats the mantra of love, honor, and obey when talking about his relationship with Megan. He seems to use this phrase as an explanation or almost as an excuse for his behavior, suggesting that anything he did wrong or anything he did at all, he did because he was loving, honoring, and obeying Megan. Tony seems to sometimes complain about Megan. In illustrating his unconditional devotion to her, he describes the extensive, expensive process of renovating the family's home in Colchester. Almost right after it was done, Megan said she wanted to move to Florida full-time. This is also the first we've heard about a demanding home renovation project. We discussed the debt and financial trouble that Tony has had in episode 4. Perhaps this renovation was another source of that trouble. We then moved into the rental house at 202 Reserve Place in Celebration because we outgrew our condo in May 2019. And it had a saltwater pool, which was good for her, and an office apartment above the detached garage that we could use to transition the business to Florida. We were not able to sell it for what it was worth, hence I commuted every week. We also discussed Tony's commuting between Florida and Connecticut in episode 4, but his description of it, including the insane hours and his lack of a consistent sleep schedule in Connecticut, is even more harrowing. He claims the commuting was out of necessity and intimates that his family couldn't function without him. When I arrived in Connecticut on Tuesdays, I would work two to nine treating patients and then in office doing work until 12 or 1 a.m., returning on Wednesdays and Thursdays in office at 6 a.m., treating from 6.30 to nine and working until 1 a.m. I would stay at a hotel or mom's couch, my choice, on Tuesday and Wednesday nights or at an Airbnb and Thursday night usually sleep in the office for a couple of hours as my flight was between 5 a.m. and 6 a.m. So I would be home in Florida in time to pick Zoe up at preschool at 11.45 a.m. or various other things previous to that. I would catch sleep on plane or wherever time permitted. It was not healthy, I realized that, as I have seen recent newspaper pics of me, but I did it all for family. When I was in Florida, I would treat my wife two to three times a day, usually 4 a.m. to 6 a.m., 9 p.m. to 10.30 p.m., and personal training activities to tolerance in afternoons daily. Do food shopping and prepare 90% of the meals, prepare two full meals for when I left for Connecticut so my son could warm up as necessary, take boys to from homeschool co-op 45 minutes away on Mondays, and to co-op on Tuesdays, with sometimes delaying my departure depending on home situation and bringing them home Tuesday afternoon prior to an evening flight. Tony says he was essentially everything to Megan, 
including her personal trainer, her physical therapist, and her source for emotional support. He paints himself as an embattled father and husband trying to keep his family afloat despite Megan. As Tony tells it, she wasn't quite the super mom people have made her out to be. It was a routine I fully accepted. I loved being a husband and a father. In addition, I would attend to whatever personal need Meg needed, depending on the day. That could include carrying her upstairs to bed, helping her shower, dress, doing Zoe's hair. I sucked at it and whatever else. I embraced it. I was determined she was going to get better, and she was, though the good days were amazing, but the bad days were even more depressing for her. We kept quiet for most part because that was how Meg wanted it. She was raised that way, as her mom was the town drunk. Her grandfather was a major democratic politician for about 30 years, and she didn't want the same eyes on her as were on her mother for her multiple ailments. We don't know whether Tony's claim that Megan's mom, Gail, struggled with alcoholism is true. We heard a lot of good things about Gail from Megan's childhood friends, including from Kirsten Bethman, whom we met in episode three. She said she didn't remember Gail as a drinker. No, not at all. In fact, it doesn't say that she wasn't, but I do not ever recall that from Gail. Gail was a teacher. And she was a teacher whether she was in the classroom or not. And she made space for us to have fun, but also the rules would be followed. Kirsten's mother, Candace Chambers, told us a story about a disturbing incident that took place sometime between 1989 and 1991 involving Megan's parents. It was strikingly similar to what we heard about Tony's family in the 80s. It was at least midnight or later. There was a more than a knock. It was a really pounding on my front door. And um, so I answered it uh, nervously, often thinking, you know, at that hour, what could that be? When I opened the door, Gail was there and she was crying and um, appeared to be frantic and it was raining. So she's dripping wet. She didn't have a jacket or anything on, uh, wide eyed. And I hadn't seen her in quite some time. So that and her state was concerning to me. So I immediately said, you know, what's happening? And she said, well, my husband and I were staying at our place, which is down by Gardner's Lake. It's just a um, a little summer thing that they have down there. And he's going to kill me. I said, Gail, I said, first of all, how did you even get to my house? She said, well, I walked. And I said, then come in and I'll call the police. And she said, no, no, I I just want you to drive me home. I said, are you sure that that's what you want to do? I asked her twice. "Um, Let's just call the police and just come into my house. And she refused. And I did drive her home and uh, she wouldn't let me come in. And I had to drop her off. The possibility of a threat of violence in Megan's family presents a strange parallel to Tony's life. We don't know for sure, but given this story, it's possible that Megan and Tony both grew up in homes where their fathers tried to kill their mothers. Kirsten and Megan grew apart when they went to different high schools, but Kirsten said it's possible Gail struggled with alcoholism later in life. Like, if you're experiencing trauma and that kind of fear that you think your husband's going to kill you, I think that maybe turning to drugs or alcohol would be a a very likely scenario in terms of trying to manage pain like that. So, I mean, it's very possible, but I don't remember that as a kid. We know that Megan and her mother hadn't spoken in years, but Kirsten said she was shocked to hear about Megan's estrangement from Gail. My entire childhood and into, you know, our adolescence, before going into high school, she still seemingly had a very close relationship with her mom. And even when we reconnected as adults, she never mentioned that. She she seemed to be very much like her mom in terms of, you know, always making these beautiful meals at the house and putting her kids first and and creating a, a very safe, fun environment for her children to grow up in. So 
I honestly was just as shocked as anybody that they had a strange. Relatives told us they don't even know what state Gail lives in. Megan's aunt Cindy told us she wasn't sure if her sister even knew that Megan and the kids were dead. She was my wife and I loved her. Like I said prior, I am still deeply in love with her. Call that illogical, I don't care. We had a love between us, described best, I think, by C.S. Lewis. Being storge, a Greek term for family love. It takes the other three loves of the Greek language, philio, friendship, eros, erotic, and apago, God, to the next level. We didn't fight, rather discuss things, although much wasn't different between us as we made sure we built a foundation of trust, respect, and admiration for and with each other before we married. It was very important for both of us, given our pasts. Hers from an alcoholic mother and living in silence because of family and political reasons, and mine stemming from 1980. That left serious trust issues, nightmares, fear, and fear of people even thinking I had any infidelity issues. We didn't even make love until a week prior to our wedding, after almost eight years of dating. Tony says that Megan's relationship with her parents played a role in the depression he said she suffered from, but also in the bond that they shared. He related her troubled past to what happened to him when he was a child. We've heard theories that the violence Tony witnessed when he was a kid led him to repeat the pattern of violence within his own family. But Tony said his past trauma, and Megan's, was a reason for the strength of their relationship. The fact that they'd both experienced traumatic events only brought them closer together. Our relationship was very close and special. Anyways, too much info, I'm sure. But I thought you needed a better understanding of our relationship. If I was there that night, this never would have happened. Hence the self-blame and self-condemnation. But because I was being selfish, I have lost everything near and dear to me, and when I leave here in a couple of months, I will be leaving homeless and without clothes. I have lost 90 pounds so far. This part of the letter had a lot to unpack. First, Tony says that he feels guilty for not being there the night his family was killed, a sentence we heard almost verbatim from the man he's writing this letter to. I hold and I have carried for a long time a lot of guilt, and I still carry it today. When we interviewed Robert, he told us that he still felt guilty that he wasn't home the night tragedy struck in Tony's childhood home. It's not guilt about what happened. It's guilt that I wasn't where I belonged the night my wife and my children were hurt. Forty years later, his son is saying the same thing about his family. Tony also says here that he wasn't there to help his family because he was being selfish. We don't exactly know what he means by that, and it brought up even more questions about what actually happened that night and whether or not Tony was home. Blue Sky Realty in Celebration has formally evicted us from the rental house, where everything is including furniture, clothes, and specialties, remembrances of my family, especially my kids. Most things can be replaced, except for the family piano, which was Meg's growing up, and the boys learned on it, and Zoe was beginning to learn. It is the most treasured item to me practically in the world, but because I have been evicted, they have the right to sell everything to make up their costs. I understand. My only hope is the estate sale is delayed due to the coronavirus, and I'm out of here before it to settle the lien and take back possession of the material things. I doubt it will happen, but I'm hoping and praying. Tony repeatedly mentions the probability of his getting out of jail soon or in a few months, which turned out not to be true. It reminded me of when, in episode 5, Judge Alan Rubenstein, while recalling his conviction of Robert Tote as a young assistant district attorney, said the elder Tote thought all he had to do was talk to the jury and he could convince them of his innocence. In reference to the condo, which is furnished and has clothes there. I'm facing foreclosure as the mortgage has not been paid since December. There are some reasons the family hasn't done so, 
and I do not know the status of my finances, as Meg handled all of it. I hated doing the financial stuff and had limited time to dedicate to it, as she loved it and had time and took over full control in 2013-2014, more so because of the guilt she was having from the buildup of medical bills. Most were private pay. Tony saying Megan handled all the finances from approximately 2013 on was shocking to me. The FBI healthcare fraud affidavit alleges that he cleared her of any responsibility and he said she doesn't know about his business practices. An employee at Tony's physical therapy practice told us the same thing. But in the letter to his father, he depicts Megan as a sick woman who could barely bathe and dress herself. In the same breath, he makes her out to be the mastermind behind the family's money, meaning she was responsible for the healthcare fraud and for the family's debt. So in Tony's estimation, Megan is both weak and helpless and strong and conniving. I had a gigantic life insurance on myself, but only a two hundred to 300000 on her. But when I get out, that will help set things right and get on my feet, I guess. It's being held because of the charges against me, as I am sole beneficiary. Just after expressing his guilt, Tony suggests again that he'll be getting out of prison soon, in just a few months. It's a sentiment that he repeats throughout this letter, that he'll be free soon, and that he's already planning what his life will look like then. We hear him say in the phone calls to his sister that when he gets out, he'll write a book. Here, he says that when he gets out, he'll be homeless. But he never acknowledges the reality of the situation, that he's in jail, charged with four counts of the most serious crime a person can be charged with, and that he likely isn't getting out anytime soon. Just months after losing his entire family, Tony is talking to his dad about his dead wife's life insurance policy. Given his circumstances, it doesn't seem a far leap to say that Tony might be detached from reality. He is writing this letter from an isolated jail cell, charged with not only killing the woman whose life insurance he's talking about, but all of their children and their dog. He says that his entire world his family that he says he loves so dearly, has just been violently taken from him. And he's talking about how he'll use Megan's insurance payout to get back on his feet. Either these are the desperate ideas of a man who is grasping for hope after his life tragically crumbled, or these are the words of a man who killed his family and is already dreaming about what's next. I hope the timing is right and everything is delayed because of the economy status due to the coronavirus. Here's hoping, I guess. I didn't do the finances and trusted her with that as a team slash partnership. I know passwords and usernames as I set up the online account and essentially use the same throughout. Oh well. Back to the explanations. I wasn't there that night because I was selfish and wanted a wonderful day as Meg described it, into a most wonderful day. Meg woke up for the first time since March 2019, and even before, though intermittently without any pain. Instead of me treating her at 4.30 a.m., we spent time together until Zoe came in, wanting breakfast. The day was phenomenal. Meg relaxed inside for the most part, joining us outside on occasion, and I spent the day with the kids doing everything from basketball to soccer, to talking, to Elsa Freeze tag, football, you name it. Meg was inside watching TV, reading recipes, listening to music, resting, and making snacks. Tony describes what sounds like the perfect day leading up to the deaths of his wife, children, and dog. He uses the words phenomenal and wonderful in talking about the day. It reminds me of the beginning of a horror movie when it's bright outside and nothing is scary. Megan wakes up without pain for the first time in years. Tony is playing sports and games with the children. Megan is relaxing inside. I had to ask myself if Tony was idealizing his final hours with his family for whatever reason. Was it really the storybook day that Tony describes before things went haywire? It was the best I've seen her in a while, especially since our miscarriage in September 2019 of Connor Michael. That was horrible, to say the least. He was eight to 10 weeks gestation. 
We initially found out at our ultrasound when Zoe was present to see baby Tote for the first time. The tech and radiologists were cold-souled in their handling of it. We were supposed to have a follow-up ultrasound two weeks later, as there was no heartbeat heard or detected. But we lost Connor prior to that. Instead of leaving the ultrasound happy, it was worse than a funeral. The result of our love and the first weekend away was no longer. It was a happy surprise to us to conceive, as we were not trying, but who knew a woman can double ovulate after the age of 40? Never covered that in sex ed or any of my medical classes. Anyways, I would ask her several times throughout the day if she needed anything and if everything was okay, and she would respond, everything is wonderful. If you get a chance, can you fix the alarm sensor on the back door? And can you go to the condo to get Zoe's Mickey necklace? She and I would really appreciate it as she keeps asking me for it. I told her that I would go after dinner, if all was okay, as I had some maintenance tasks there, and it would be easier to do without children. She responded, perfect, as I want everybody to go to bed early anyways, because everyone is still getting over the stomach bug. I agreed and also told her I would crash at the condo or in the office apartment above the garage as, one, I was a bull in a china closet when I was tired and I was extremely because of insomnia the night before and two, she started to use natural oil and air fresheners that was giving me sinus issues since Thanksgiving and I would snore or just have difficulty sleeping. Tony mentions that the kids were recovering from a stomach bug which is something that we'd heard from Megan's aunt and uncle, Cindy and Stuart. They said that when they were texting the family in December, Megan, or Tony pretending to be Megan, sent them texts that they were all battling the flu. Tony mentioning this flu in the letter is either a confirmation that they were actually sick at that time, or it's an example of him concocting this story and trying to cover his tracks with lies he's already told. I also told her I would fix the sensors one night after the boys were asleep with Gorilla Glue because Tyler would jump up to touch them and constantly knock them off. He was my energetic and daring son. He wanted me to go skydiving with him on his 18th birthday, and I told him it would have to be his 21st birthday as I would need a serious drink before and after. Whereas Alec was into cars and wanted me to be his best man at his wedding, shows the difference between them. He wanted a blue Camaro convertible for his first car, so I rented one for a weekend, but I told him we would start him with a pink Cadillac. He didn't enjoy that. I did. Sorry, I switched to script. I hope you can read it. It was tedious and painful. You see, when they took me into custody, they dropped me down 10 stairs, handcuffed, behind my back. Needless to say, after hearing, that's why we hold on to someone in custody, deputy. I had extreme back pain, shoulder and neck pain, and bilateral hand wrist pain. I have nerve damage in my left hand, right wrist sprain, right shoulder rotator cuff disruption and labral tear, left shoulder rotator cuff problem, cervical and lumbar radiculopathy, sacroiliac dysfunction, and daily migraines. The question of what exactly Tony remembers has always been a bit confusing. But here he seems to directly contradict something he said in the phone calls with Chrissy. He said he doesn't remember anything between Christmas and arriving at jail. But in this letter, he remembers specific details about falling down the stairs while in custody and what one of the law enforcement officers said to him. They gave me a med to help with the nerve pain so I could sleep, but that gave me freaky tales from the crypt nightmares. So they discharged it. So part of my day, I do self-PT and keep daily notes. I'm a mess, but mentally healthy, and a clean bill of health for the most part, except for orthopedic issues. My hypertension, EKG, thyroid, sugars, CK levels, and cholesterol are all normal now. And pending the results of the blood work, I should be discharged of all my remaining meds next week. I will stay on the low-dose antidepressant until after the trial, by my agreement. I'm 10 to 15 pounds from my ideal weight now, and I have the re-emergence of my six-pack that I had playing college soccer. 
So in that department, all is good or improving. So before dinner, I moved the minivan to the driveway under the basketball hoop as I needed tools for maintenance. In addition, I asked the boys to load any boxes so I could dispose of them at the appropriate dumpster at the condo. I was also bringing the minivan over to the condo as to bring more stuff back to the house. After dinner, Meg warmed up leftovers and I had a protein shake. The boys said everything was set and Meg pleaded with me to get the necklace as Zoe was driving her nuts about it. I drove over to the condo, literally thinking to myself about how wonderful the day was and how my Zoe was going to light up the room with her smile when I brought back the necklace. Upon parking the van, I went to get the tools out and they were not there. I walked back five minutes and found the boys playing basketball. I asked them what happened to the tools. They looked dumbfounded and pointed to them on the base of the basketball hoop. They explained that the doors were locked, so they left them there. Of course, they only checked one door, the hatch. I couldn't be mad at them as I did the same thing often to my father growing up. Instead, I chased them, wrestled with them, laughed and tickled them. They were great boys, never needed any real discipline as they were brought up correctly. Every once in a while, they needed to be separated, being competitive brothers, but they were wonderful to all, especially their little sister. Their relationship was awesome, and she adored them in every way. The boys asked me to play basketball, and I, of course, said yes. I always remember a friend of mine doing one of those silly prom dances, like the electric slide on soccer opening day. And I, of course, laughed at him as he really looked foolish. He turned to me and said, kids only ask you to do things with them for a short amount of time. Then they stop. And I don't want to have any regrets. I remembered that daily, and now I am living it. So we played for a while in spite of being exhausted, and it was starting to get late. So I told them to go inside, and I was going back to the condo with the tools. They said mom was preparing dessert, and was I going to join them? I said no as I was trying to lose some weight, etc. I had told them to remind mommy that I was going to sleep at the condo or the upstairs apartment, and I hugged and kissed them. After walking back to the minivan to get my keys, I sat in the driver's seat and wanted to take a small siesta. I was tired. The snooze button became my best friend until the battery of the iPod drained. Meg could still find me and alert me through the Find My Phone app if she needed me, so I wasn't worried. In his phone calls with his sister, Tony says he fell asleep by accident while retrieving Zoe's necklace from the condo. But in the letter to his father, Tony says he planned to sleep at the condo the night of the murders. In both cases, he says he overslept. In the phone call, he accidentally fell asleep. But in the letter, he says he had intended to sleep at the condo, and he ended up falling asleep in his car. This part of the letter is an example of Tony outright contradicting something that he said before. It's evidence that either here, in this letter, or earlier, in conversations to his sister, he was lying. When talking to Chrissy, Tony said he knew that she or Cindy, Megan's aunt, would be down to the condo soon to take care of things, presumably after something happened to him and his family. But in this letter, he says that he casually went over to the condo with his tools to fix some things that Megan had asked him to take care of. Which version is the truth? Did he go to the condo to get Zoe's necklace as a last thing they needed before something final, knowing he'd never go back there? Or was he spending a normal day checking things off of a to-do list? In one version, he's planning on never stepping foot in that condo again. In another, he's making improvements to the home. He also contradicts himself in his accounts of Zoe's necklace. In the letter... He says that Megan asked him to look for Zoe's necklace while he was at the condo, that she and Zoe would really appreciate it. In the phone calls, he says that he desperately searched for that necklace, the last thing they needed for reasons he told his sister she'd find out later. These aren't the first things we've heard that point to Tony lying. When investigators went to the home the day of his arrest, he lied to them. In recordings of interviews from that day, Agent Melissa O'Neill says she asked Tony where Zoe was, and other investigators say they asked him where Megan was and where the boys were. 
and he told them that Megan was asleep upstairs and that his kids might be at a sleepover, when in reality, they were all dead just a few feet away, and he knew that. It seemed to me that Tony was writing two letters to his father. One meant to absolve himself of the allegations that he killed his family, the other to catch a once estranged father up on his life and his family. At certain points, Tony brags in the letter. He says his kids were raised correctly. He tells his father about the six pack of abs he's working on. We know from episode five that physical fitness is important to Bob Tote. I'm 67 years old and I bench 318 pounds. The bitterness we heard from Chrissy and Tony about Robert during their phone call is replaced by a sort of mutual understanding. As Tony forgives Robert for what happened in 1980 and expects Robert will forgive him for his transgressions. And just as Robert says he regrets not being home that night in 1980, Tony says he feels the same guilt for being absent the night his family was killed. I woke up with the morning sun. I woke up in a panic not really knowing the time. But I knew I missed our 4 or 4.30 a.m. standing treatment time and was prepared to receive a scolding, as I would on occasion if I forgot to do something. But this would have been harsher. I tried to start the minivan, but it wouldn't start. Turns out the seat was pushed too far back to fully engage the brake sensor. So I grabbed my tool bag and scurried back to the house, fearful of the scolding. I returned home and put my tools in the garage and noticed our electric car was there. I entered the house to find the melted dessert and remnants in plates on the table. It was some sort of fruit pudding pie in a graham cracker crust. It looked very good, as all of my wife's desserts were, but smelled horrible. Turns out it was a Benadryl pudding pie. In the next episode, you'll hear the rest of the letter, in which Tony describes what else he discovered when he went back to the house. If you or someone you know is in crisis, help is available. Call Mental Health America's Crisis Hotline at 1-800-273-TALK. If you haven't already, please subscribe to Looking for the Tote Family on your favorite podcast app. And don't forget to rate the show. Find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Looking for the Tote Family is hosted and reported by Taylor Hartz and Sten Spinella. Produced by Peter Huapi and Carlos Virgen. Written by Taylor Hartz, Sten Spinella, and Peter Huapi. Editing by Peter Huapi and music by Carlos Virgen. Tim Cotter is our executive editor. And Izaskun Larnieta is our managing editor. Social media management by interns Josette Moses and Allison O'Donnell. This has been a production of The Day in New London, Connecticut.